All right, all right, all right. Don't take it personally, they're always like this when I'm on stage. So, I want to... Who's, uh, who's, um, who's doing the smoking then? Who's doing the... Don't worry, I reckon that if we don't draw attention to it, we'll skip the fine. Does that mean Matt Rack's not here to check the fire, <laughs> fire stuff? So, mate, it's a bit warm in here. Do you not want to take off your jacket? The man's, the man's not hot. <laughs> oh, my G. My G. So, I want to be a bit sincere for a second. A little bit sincere. So, since you've become Labour leader, there has been this mood of elation and hope. I was walking around, um, you know, by Camden Town Hall. And I was just thinking about how much better life is going to be under a Labour government. And then, yeah. It's, it's going to be like this, but all the time. And then this guy, who was kind of cute, came up to me and was like, so, uh, why are you smiling, darling? You thinking about me? And I had to be honest and be like, no, I was thinking about Jeremy Corbyn becoming <laughs> Prime Minister. Sounds like a conversation killer. <laughs> Yeah, no, he sort of looked at me and was like, second thoughts. So the country's gone through a bit of a dark time. Things are getting better. And you know who else has been going through a bit of a dark time? Your beloved Arsenal FC. Oh. But, and it pains me to do this as a rabid Spurs fan. What? A rabid what's Spurs go, fan. What's going on here? To announce Arsenal's new star signing... Thank you. Shall we honour it to Hector Bellerin? Because he, he saw off Piers Morgan, didn't he? <laughs> um, we're going to hand over to you to tell us a bit about your visions for not just the future of Britain, but next season as well. Maybe tell us how you've been enjoying your Thursday nights recently. Well, the, the, um, you know, the bus journey to Belarus is long and slow. But... Um, the journey's going to be worth it in the end. And uh, we're quite lucky that um, no team in Vladivostok is playing in the Europa League. It would be an awfully long journey for a Thursday night. But you know what? After the cup final, do you remember that? And you know something? I mean, you'll love this as a Spurs supporter. I don't want to be difficult about oh this, but can you think of it this way? Who's won more matches at Wembley this year? <laughs> Arsenal or Spurs? <laughs> Listen, I'm not about, I am not about to be the future Prime Minister on stage, but if afterwards I'll take my earrings out, someone can hold my bag, we'll settle this the old-fashioned way. I've got a nice little box you can put your earrings in, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, I bumped into you on the tube wait, a year can, can ago. I, can I say something about yeah. Arsenal? It's, you'll Oof. like this bit, actually. You'll, you'll like this bit, actually, because this is inclusive. This is the caring, sharing, lovely Arsenal that you know and love, really. After the cup final, you remember that. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I'm very sure that the majority of this audience are not Arsenal supporters, so you've got to be quite careful here. Don't worry, I'm, used to, I'm very used to being in a minority. <laughs> that um, I came out of the cup final and I was stopped. They said, OK, Corbyn. Your lot's going to get smashed in the election. You're going to get trounced. Your party's going to be finished. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I said, um, do you know what? The underdog in red is more dogged than you ever thought. Watch this space. Yeah, mate, I've got, I've got nothing. I've got nothing compared to that. Mm? I've got nothing compared to that. Oh, I don't no. have any good political analogues with Spurs. All I have is an agonising <laughs> and toxic 25-year relationship, really. It's brutal. We can help you out. <laughs> <laughs> we're a caring party and organisation. The kind, we the gentler, We're very kind, very gentle. We'll help you out. No problem at all. 
So I think these lovely people are waiting for you to give one of your characteristic barnstorming speeches, Jez. Can I um, first of all say it's a wonderful tradition in the Labour Party. You try to um, reduce the levels of joy. So you organise a party to end conference and you start it off with a speech. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to get better later on. Thanks. Uh, who's, who said that? Who said that? Oh, very good. The droll man over there with the yellow tie on. Thank you. I think the, the way in which in the second year running we've had the World Transformed event as an event parallel to and involved and part of the atmosphere of our conference is absolutely fantastic because you've provided the space, the verve, the inspiration and above all the opportunity for people to come here and share their views, share their visions, share their ideas, ask difficult and searching questions and continue to inspire and debate because that is really what politics is all about. And next year in Liverpool, obviously I don't know what the venue is going to be, but let's make the world transformed absolutely an essential part of the whole conference spirit because that is what it is about. So I want to say thank you to all of you for what you've done over the world transformed. And I'm very proud, very proud to have been able to come here and support the World Transformed. And I, I know you've had uh, Naomi Klein here speaking to you, and I was very pleased when she accepted the invitation that we sent her to ask her to speak to party conference, because I've admired what she's written and done for a very long time, and I had the pleasure of doing a big event at the Paris Climate Change Conference with Barry Gardner, and we had um, a very big meeting one evening discussing issues not just of the very serious questions about climate change and um, global warming and the obvious effects of all of that, but a much more profound discussion as well about attitudes to the environment, about pollution, of damage to water quality, air quality, reforestation, and all those issues, about the mindset of how you deal with the environment. Now, Naomi has written extensively on all this and then taken it into a challenge on speculative economics which leads to rust belt towns, left behind communities, unbelievable levels of poverty, a sense of hopelessness and a fertile feeding ground for those that would exploit that hopelessness to blame somebody else and pander to racism and let racism grow as a result of it. Surely we can do a lot better. So I think the very profound questions that she put in a speech to conference today are something that is educative of all. And I want to thank her for that. And also thank Tom Watson for what he also said about the gig economy and automation within our society, because we have to deal with and confront these issues. If you think about it, previous industrial revolutions the first ones that um, developed steam power, that led to industrialization, that led to the manufacture of steel, were huge and profound, and led to a mass exodus from rural communities in Britain into the urban centers, and led to also the Enclosure Acts, which took away the ability of rural communities to sustain themselves and force tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of workers into industrial slums. That led to, eventually, a profound political change. But to begin with, it wasn't a profound political change. It was a sense of desperation and hopelessness. Later industrial changes and revolutions led to industrial warfare in the First World War and led after the First World War to electronics industry growing up, to a more high-tech industries growing up, which had, again, a parallel effect on older industrial areas. And so the process has gone on. At every stage of those revolutions, immediately the very richest were made very rich, the very poorest suffered the most, and the most oppressive governments took over to deal with the issues of what the poorest were putting up with. Oppression of trade unions, oppression of human rights, and uh, 
appalling treatment of the very poorest. And so we now move to a whole new revolution in terms of uh, very high technology, in terms of automation, and, and all those issues. Are we going to stand back and say that this new automation will create the multi, multi, multi billionaires of a small number of people who've got hold of the technology and can therefore control a lot of industry from that? Or are we going to be strong enough to say we want and will do something very different so that the benefits of technology shared amongst all rather than used as a wealth and power grab for the very few? These are not... <laughs> these are not simple issues, but they're issues that have been raised. But it's also how we deal with that. And so I hope that uh, the policy discussions we'll be having by everybody reaching out, popular, public discussions, will lead to that profound change in thinking. Because when we look for an election, maybe next year, maybe the year after, I can't predict exactly when it will be. I've no idea what plans Theresa May has to walk in the Welsh hills. Um, <laughs> But uh, we have to have those debates and those discussions. And I look to the spirit of the world transformed and the work that Momentum and others are doing to make sure that we widen those discussions out. Everybody can make some contribution to it. And the more they're involved in thinking about what we do for the future, the stronger we will be and the more determined we'll be to win that election whenever it comes, and the better prepared we'll be for going into government after that. Two other things I want to say is this, that um, our society, our people, are actually incredibly creative. People all over the world are incredibly creative. Music, song, dance, theater, art, all that is very, very creative. I think too often, we're almost apologetic, ashamed of the idea we're a bit creative, and we oft, too often suppress it in children and young people and don't give them that chance. And I think one of the most important things we can do is um, improve our education system so that we don't uh, drive the creativity out of young people, we positively welcome it and encourage it. <laughs> Hence, Hence my views, hence uh, the views we all have on, on music, art, and theatre education. So it's there for all of us and for the many. And it doesn't actually have to be exclusive. It can be there at all times and uh, helps children feel included in their communities, included in their lives and what they're going to do. But also understand the way in which um, everyone is creative in many ways all through their lives, even in the worst of circumstances. Somebody that I'm very fond of and a great admirer of is the writer Ben Okri. He has had a difficult and very complicated life, and for some time he was homeless, but he was still writing when he was homeless. He'd be sleeping rough and then going into a library and writing during the day. And so he had this thirst to put down on paper what his ideas and his experience were. And you look at so many writers that have achieved so much in that sense. So think of all those stories of refugees that are not being written down. Those people that are going through the most horrendous times in their lives in refugee camps around the world and suffering as a result. So. I was very pleased a couple of days ago to be given a book of um, refugee stories and refugee poetry. Fascinating, amazing stuff. They're human beings just like all of us and they want to contribute to the good of all of us. And so it's up to us practically to reach out, practically to help and support people. And last Saturday, I met um, a young man in a um, local facility around here. And he said, you remember me, don't you? And I said, yeah. Really, really sorry, not sure. He said, you know what? You last saw me in Calais in the refugee camp two years ago. And he's now here contributing to our society and our community. Well done, him. And so 
it is about that, and it is about our attitude towards the rest of the world, the way we, which we deal with the environmental and refugee crises, the way in which we work for and look for a world of peace, in which we look for the causes of war, the causes of instability, and the dangers that those unstable places bring about for the rest of us, which is why I said what I said during the election campaign about all that, and I will continue in that direction and keep on saying that, because we do need to have a different approach to the whole world. There's only one planet that I know of that's got anybody living on, so let's look after it. And this conference has been a, a, an incredible experience because it's the biggest Labour Party conference that's ever been in my lifetime, as I said the other day. And uh, I've been to pretty well every Labour Party conference since before 1970, so I've got a good lot to compare it to. And it's been one of the most inclusive and one of the most respectful of each other that I can remember for a very long time. And that, and that is how it must be. If we believe in socialism, if we believe in the goodness of all human beings to do things for each other, then we have to set an example of how we treat each other as well. How we relate to each other, how we respect each other, particularly when you don't agree with each other. Because from that, it doesn't show weakness, that is strength. And then uh, I've got quite a lot of places I've got to go to this evening, and I've got a little job on tomorrow, which I've got to get ready for. Um, uh, I just want to conclude with this. I was doing a number of um, interviews today, and uh, they said to me, what would be your first priority with the Labour government? And there's obviously lots and lots of things that, are the immediate priority of announcements you'd make, decisions you'd take, and so on. But they, I said to them as this, I said, there's something that is profoundly wrong, the housing in this country. That too many people are living insecure lives in private rented accommodation, high rents, short tenancies, and children growing up not knowing where their home's going to be next month, next week, or even sometimes the next day. All they know is they're going to be evicted and they've got to present themselves at the housing department and find which other flat they're going to be sent to for another six months. Imagine what that does to those children and their perceptions of community and life and security. And so, as far as I'm concerned, our priority, there are many, but the first priority has to be saying we will set in train a process, as was done in the debate today, on housing, on housing security, and housing investment. That will mean, yes, spending money on housing. Yes, it will mean spending money employing people to build those houses. Yes, it will mean spending money on employing people to provide the services for those houses. And in building good quality houses at proper, secure, affordable rents, you're building strong communities at the same time. And so we also look at cooperative housing. And then I said the priority, and John, and John McDonnell explained this very well in his speech to conference, that what we want to do is measure the success of us, of our government, by our inclusion of everybody in what we do while, as a party, but also in government what we do to lower inequality, increase opportunity for the poorest and most marginal, and ensure a sense of fairness across the country. So coalfield communities where the pits were closed under Thatcher will get the investment they need and deserve. <laughs> that whole swathes, whole swathes of the country will not be left behind as they have been in this unfair race which has left so many communities with high levels of unemployment, low, low quality, low paid jobs. It's simply wrong. And so it is what we do. So we campaign, so we talk, so we debate, so above all we take out that message there of what we can achieve and how that other world could be achieved and is very, very possible. I want to thank Momentum for what they've done. I want to thank the World Transform for being here and what it's achieved. And 
so many people have said to me how they have come along to the world transformed. They didn't really know what it was. They were slightly skeptical about it. I've no idea why, but they might have read something about it in the papers. Uh, who knows? And they've come along and said how interesting it was, how welcome they were made to feel, and how much they learnt from being here. Everybody we meet knows something else, knows something we don't know. People have different ideas and different concepts. Don't dismiss them, listen to them, learn from them, and that makes us all stronger at the end of it. What we're doing is building a movement, a movement of hope, of opportunity, a movement of determination, a movement that recognizes we cannot go on headlong into greater inequality, greater injustice, greater poverty, and at the extreme end of that, more and more homelessness. Or we can go in the other direction of doing things differently and better. And you know what? We will. Thank you very much. She's also like quite gorgeous and mother to the most famous baby on Twitter. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce Ava Vidal. Oh my God, what? Ava Vidal's coming in five minutes. <laughs> First up. Michael. Michael Walker's now the runner. He's been demoted. Okay, so we've got speech of the week. See, Jez leaves the stage and it all absolutely falls apart. You need he leadership. He was the glue holding the show together. So we've got speech of the week. Speech of the week. Who was his name, Michael? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Navarro and me, you were a little bit last minute, but you know, sometimes it works out. When we had Jeremy, I think he saved the day. Uh, next, conference isn't just about leaders, it's also about members making incredible delegate speeches. This is speech of the week. It's gonna be a video, then we're gonna get the fellow on himself, Daniel Harris, he's a housing activist from Brighton. So we're gonna watch the video first. Get the video on. Here we go, here we, here we, here we go. They'll tell me when they fixed it. I'll give you a brief speech. Won't be as good as Jeremy, huh? Everybody. Everybody. We got a bar. Get a drink. Okay? If you don't drink, get a water. You know, it's very hot. You're going to get dehydrated. We're going to party. This has been the most phenomenal Labour Party conference ever. Ever. And this guy gave the best speech. Here we go.
Hello, conference. My name's Daniel Harris, and I represent the Hove CLP. Look, we just have people talking. Enough of this rubbish. Get over out here. Enough of this. This is Michael Walker all over, you know. Ava, yes. Here we go. Tom, no? Okay. I had a really difficult decision to make um, just now, whether I put down the baby or the beer. <laughs> it was really tough. How is everyone? Is everyone all right? Are you pleased to be at Labour Conference? Good, good, good. How amazing is Jeremy Corbyn? Yeah. Got to say how much I love Jeremy Corbyn. The reason why I was on a bit late is because Jeremy was recording a message for my family in Dominica. Um, anybody who's from the Caribbean um, has seen what has happened there in the last week or so, and we're still missing people. And so Jeremy was kind enough to record a message. So can we give him a round of applause for that, please? Um, I must say that I absolutely love Jeremy. I think what Jeremy has done, and it's really reflected... Hi, Mike. <laughs> it's, been Get off. it's been really reflected in just the people that I'm seeing in this room tonight. For so long, people were, felt like they were locked out of politics. They weren't allowed to make any comment. They, weren't, they weren't, felt like they weren't listened to. Um, it was quite interesting. I had a really good chat with, uh, I was talking about this on social media and anyone who knows my Twitter feed knows I get into a lot of arguments um, and I said that basically what Jeremy has done is he's made politics open for people who are not ex-public school boys. Um, so then I had to do a disclaimer because this woman went, didn't you go to public school? And I said, well, yeah. And she went, well, <laughs> I think that's really disappointing. And when I look at you, I don't see public school. And I found that quite offensive. Because I'm like, if... <laughs> Do you mind? <laughs> Do you see this? Do you mind? Do you mind? <laughs> well, I said, if you look at me and you don't see public school, essentially what you're saying is this level of ar arrogance, self-delusion and lack of respect for others comes naturally. It doesn't. We <laughs> work for it. I just, um, I, I'm so happy because basically politics in this country was veering right. And a couple of years ago, I did a show called uh, This Week. And I was sharing a dressing room with Nigel Farage. And it always amazes me when people go, oh, what's happened to BBC comedy? They don't know comedy anymore. They put me in a dressing room with Farage. They know comedy. It was awful, but he was basically boasting at the... Hold on a second, excuse me. Have you got something to add? Bad, bad. <laughs> oh, hell no. Hell no. I've been up here sweating, doing comedy for you guys, got not one round of applause. And my daughter talks nonsense. And she gets applause and cheers. Do you remember my daughter? She was the um, anti-Brexit baby on uh, Channel 4 for a little while. Um, until she got fired, basically, for spitting milk at another guest. Bless her. Bless her. So I do, like I was saying, um, I think that this election, because of Jeremy, was fought very, very differently from the 2015 election. And I don't know if you guys felt this, but I felt really disappointed in 2015. Um, the way that Labour was going, because it seemed like everybody was trying to compete with Farage to see who could be the big... I just realised who I've got in my arms. Who could be the biggest twat? Um, I was going to say another word. Um, and I was so disappointed. And I remember doing a gig. Uh, it was a Tony Benn memorial gig. And I, Neil Kinnock was on. And I was there and I was saying, basically, I'm really disappointed with the way that Labour is going because they had these anti-immigration mugs. Did you see them? And we're thinking, what the hell? Because basically all our families of immigrants vote for Labour, right? And I was thinking it is completely out of order that they're basically turning on their core fans, right? And um, I had a conversation about immigration around the 2015 election. I was told 
that I was, some guy had said to me on the TV show that I wasn't allowed to talk about immigration. And I said, why? He said, because you're not really English. Um, and I said, I am English. He went, yeah, prove it. I was like, mate, I'm a fucking alcoholic. How much more commitment to this country is one supposed to show? And I thought, was there a defining moment in my life where I realized I was English? And there was. Um, and basically, when I was younger, I would have failed the Norman Tebbit cricket test because I was West Indies all the way, all the way, right? But when I realized, two things made me realize maybe I am English. The first thing was when I went to the Caribbean and they said, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm Caribbean. They were like, no, you're not. Um, <laughs> the second thing was when I was out late one night and I was on the phone texting and I wasn't looking where I was going and I smashed face first into a lamppost and then I said sorry to it. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this should be the Britishness test. So I did this show about immigration and uh, I wasn't sure that I wanted to do it and they basically told me that I would... Everyone is just waving at this baby and distracting us. They, they said to me, no, we're going to treat the subject of immigration really seriously. I said, really? And they said, yeah, we promise, Ava. And when I got there, I saw how seriously they were taking it, because Katie Hopkins was also a guest. Which is, um, I've worked with her a couple of times. Do you want to just go? <laughs> I've worked with her for a, a couple of times, and people always say, I can't believe they're actually cheering the baby. <laughs> So people say to me, what is Katie Hopkins actually like? And I said, it's kind of weird, right? Because when there's not a camera on her, she pretends to be a, a normal human being. Um, so she's back in the dressing room offering to make tea for everybody. As soon as they put that camera on her, she starts coming out with some retro racism, right? That I have not heard for years. So they went, Katie, what do you think about Emma? And she went, send them back, send them all back, send them way back. And then afterwards, right, when you do these shows, they have cars outside waiting for you with your name in the window. So Katie ran in the dressing room, she got all her stuff and she ran out because there was loads of black and brown people in there. So <laughs> she goes and then she had to come back and she came back and she was like, this is disgusting. Someone stole my cab. I went, no one stole it, Katie. It was driven by an immigrant. He fucked off. It's what you wanted. <laughs> but I think anyone who, who follows politics and has got any sense, um, they, they know that if this comes in cycles. Like every few years, it's someone different that they pick on. Every few years, it's a different scapegoat. It was like... Um, Irish people, Jewish people, Muslim people, black people. And this guy said to me once, he goes, um, I'm black and Muslim. I went, oh, mate, you're fucked. You're fucked. And is anyone else sick of what's going on with the Muslim community right now? Can we just leave them alone? Leave them the fuck alone. It's constant, it's boring, and it's stupid, and it's not clever, okay? We're a nation of alcoholics. We have a community here that don't drink. We need designated drivers. Please leave them alone. My friend is a Muslim woman, um, so she wears the hijab. She's, she's visibly Muslim, and you know most of the attacks on Muslim people are on Muslim women. And so my friend gets a lot of grief, because you know these people are brave, so they, they attack women. So my friend um, and I, we were at a taxi rank, minding our own business, and this woman we didn't know starts shouting across the road, going, Oi, you! You! And we were like, who is she talking to? And she ran across the road, and she pointed in my friend's face, and she went, You! Say sorry for 9-11 now! And I said, I beg your pardon? And she goes, I want her to say sorry for 9-11 right now. And of course I was shocked. And I looked at her and I looked at my friend and I went, oh my God. Was that you? <laughs> oh, come on. You think you know someone. Atrocious behavior. Right, I have to go in a minute. Who, who's seen anyone here? Uh, who have we seen that's quite exciting to see at the Labour conference? Anyone seen it? Who, who won? 
Oh, me. Oh, that's lovely. I saw Chuka Amuna, which is a... You see, Chuka Amuna is like... He's a little bit too good looking for politics, really, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? And that kind of makes me not trust him. Do you know? I don't trust men that look like Chuka. The last man I trusted that looked like Chuka, that happened. Uh, I do think I have to go now. Um, we are running a little bit late. Any questions? I'm asking because, huh? Her name is Mimi, and you will see her in the Jeremy Corbyn reggae video, which is uh, available to download right now. All right, Mimi? She's not listening. She doesn't care. Um, so if you guys want, you can follow me on social media, but please do it respectfully. Um, because I did leave Twitter once, because I don't want to boast or anything, but I was getting a lot of racist tweets. And I thought, yeah, I'll leave Twitter. Then what are they going to do? And what they did was they emailed it to me and it was no longer limited to 140 characters, right? <laughs> so essentially I made my own life worse, so I'm back on. But this guy sent me an email and I think, he, you know, I, he tricked me. Because in the email subject heading it said, Dear Miss Vidal, and I thought, oh. And I opened it, right? And I think the guy might have been angry because it was in capital letters and it was in red. And uh, he said, I hate you. I hate everything about you. Fuck off back to Africa because you're nothing but a fucking ugly black cunt. I know. And I read that and I was like, ugly. Oh. <laughs> the rest of it is fine. I've got my ticket unpacked. Um, but that bit was just rude. And I will say for the sake of balance, because um, I do want to get back on the BBC. The BBC are very funny, though. Did anyone see me on Newsnight? I was on Newsnight defending Jeremy, right? And then they bloody put me in the express the next day and questioned my mental health. Like that whole thing that was going on, like they were not paying attention to the people and what was actually happening. So they open up Newsnight and they basically do a party political broadcast for the Conservative Party. They talk about how amazing Theresa May is, how brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And then Kirsty turns around to me and she goes, oh, Ava, why don't you think people are getting behind Jeremy? Look at what you've just done. Look at what you guys are doing the whole time. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so I do want to say what Jeremy has done for all of us here and made us more positive and made us want to get back out there, made us want to get involved in politics. Um, he's addressing racism. And like I said, I complained actually about the immigration mugs. I said, these mugs are racist and I don't want to see a racist Labour Party. And then this woman got really angry with me and she got up and she goes, why are you talking rubbish? You're always causing trouble, Diane. <laughs> so, like I say, I will say for balance, um, I did get hate mail from a black guy, I did. And he said, I'm, I really don't like it when you go on stage and talk about racism. It's not a laughing matter. I said, we can laugh about anything. He goes, no, because if you talk about racism, what that means is that you don't know your history. Did you know that white people went to Africa and stole everything of value, like diamonds and gold? And I went, well, yeah, but I've been watching hip hop videos on MTV Base. <laughs> we got most of that back. <laughs> Guys, you've been absolutely delightful. It is so hot up here. Thank you for listening to me. And Let's do that bit in The Lion King where they throw Simba. Wait. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. I think she might poop. Sorry. Oh wow. So, uh, oh. Yes. Yeah, got a phone. Oh, Ava. Yep. Ava. Not work? I think it doesn't have an on button. It does have an on button. Oh, it's sort of like This one works. Ava, you've forgotten your phone. Before you leave. Yeah, this one's <laughs> Okay. Anyway, we, we don't need YouTube. You don't need to hear Daniel Harris's speech on YouTube. Our cable was broken. You can hear it in real time, real life. The one and only speech of the week. 
Daniel Harris. Hello, guys. Hi. Hi. We did have it prepared, but as per usual with socialists, we got no money and it always goes wrong. But anyway, I'm here now. Jo Jeremy was absolutely amazing and he really has inspired me. This is my first conference and I am a care leaver, which means I was, in, I was a previously looked after child. And the reason why I went to conference is to talk about people that are vulnerable today. People that are in society who are left behind and hidden in homes that are not affordable. They're in temporary accommodation and they're living on the streets. We've got homeless, it's been raised across this whole conference. And what's come across the most this week is this city, this country, do not care about the homeless. They don't care about mothers that have gone through domestic violence. They don't care about students that are trying to make our society better. And most of all, they don't care about us. The real people in society who are making the difference. We're paying the taxes every single day. And it's an abomination that in this city, you need £900 per month to live in substandard emergency accommodation. No rights. I've got one message for Theresa May and the Tories. They lied to us. They told us in the 80s this right to buy was going to be amazing. You can own your own home. They told us they were going to replace every home sold like for like. They fucking lied. So, this is my message to Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party. We do not want one million homes. We don't want two, three or four. We want five million council homes. Go on! Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. Thanks for having me, guys. Good night. I don't know about you, but that puts me in the mood to like set fire some Tories or something. You know, I'm very Muslim, we can't joke about these things. So, uh, so what well, I am more than excited, more than hyped to introduce you now is the rudest bitch on Twitter, Matt Zab Cousin. My G, my G. How's it all going? You alright? It's good, mate. We are going to have to mic share, so I'm just going to hand over to you. Okay. You tell me precisely what's wrong with the Liberal Commentariat, who you loathe most in the Labour Party, and who you like. Three things. Okay, how long have we got? <laughs> Lock the doors. If you think this is chaos, you should have seen a PLP meeting during the coup. Bloody hell. Um, anyway, we're all through that. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, I, um, what's wrong with the Liberal Commentariat? They're all living in 1997. Still haven't caught up with 2017, the changing context, the changing world, the fact that everything now, uh, most people aren't getting on well, aren't doing well, and we need transform transformative government. And most people recognise that. That's why we're ahead in the polls. And as Aaron Bastani says, it will go higher. <laughs> um, who do I hate most in the Labour Party? Uh, is Michael Duggar still count? <laughs> Probably. Uh, and I'll tell you what, shame, shame, I just have to say, Seamus Milne gets such bad publicity and bad press. And the guys made such good calls, like, when I was there, it would have been so easy to take a position against Brexit. In fact, that's what uh, Owen Smith wanted to do. And if he'd have won, I think the Tories would have called an election there and then. And it would have been the end of the Labour Party. So I think the way that he's handled that, his political strategy, his foresight, the fact that he's so loyal to Jeremy, I think he gets such bad press, it'd be great to give a big cheer for Seamus Mill. Thanks very much. Cheers. So, fam, one more question for you. Have you bumped into Here we go. Can I, uh, I want to say one thing. Yeah. Ian Dale, 
the most irrelevant man in politics today. No, 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 no. Look, I haven't finished my Indale. Listen, you don't pull that LBC shit here. You don't get to censor me. You don't get to rig our media. You racist, potato-headed mother. Okay? Anyway, Indale. There we go. Look, there's a wire. It can't go wrong. <laughs> Ian Dale, who is so irrelevant that he has to write lists about who is relevant. As if anybody cares what Ian Dale thinks. Nonetheless, even Ian Dale can get things right. Ian Dale called Matt Saab. Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. The 29th most influential person on the left today. In the year of our Lord, 2017, how does that make you feel? Uh, mixed feelings, really. Uh, 29 is pretty good, higher than I expected. I've probably reached peak now. It's going to be downhill from here. Uh, it will go higher. <laughs> thanks, for, <laughs> thanks very much for having me on. I'm not going to bore you anymore. M Matt, before you do go, you do phenomenal work on gambling. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. And for people out there, anybody watching, how can they inform themselves? Are there any organizations they need to follow on Twitter or Facebook? Because Matt's explained this to me. I, I think I'm political. And what's going on around gambling, around, you know, very easy to access betting shops, phenomenal. It's something you want to work on and change. So yeah, we've got you on Twitter. Uh, I'll talk to you about the It's on my Twitter feed. Have a, have a watch. If you agree with the campaign, then that's fantastic. Write to your MP, get them to back uh, estate production on fixed odds betting terminals. That review's in October. So thank you so much. Cheers, Aaron. Thanks for that. OK, right. So we have got four guests. We have got one mic. We're going to make this work, right? We're going to make this work? <laughs> so it is my great pleasure to introduce to us the left's favorite uncle, the Reverend Dr. Paul Mason. Yeah. Wow, we've got another. Oh, Paul Mason. Oh, Paul Mason. And not just that, you lucky, lucky people, you never had it so good. Chris Williamson, MP. Too busy signing autographs. Too busy signing autographs to come in here. I don't know, what are we talking about? Chris, Chris, we're going to talk about what else? The rigged system. Oh, right. And how are we going to unrig it? Well, absolutely, yeah. And we've got Paul Mason here who's going to help us uh, do that. Um, one of the rigged systems that I've been very upset about is the rigged system for selecting members of parliament, selecting <laughs> Labour candidates. and. I've made myself a bit unpopular with some of my colleagues in the Parliamentary Labour Party because I've been calling for the reintroduction of mandatory reselection. And uh, I could do with your support in continuing to build a movement to democratise the party to make sure that the people who are representing the Labour Party in Parliament are genuinely representing the members and the supporters of the Labour Party and not the faceless corporations, which was the case under the new Labour era. And if we can, if we can, if we can deal with that part of the rig system, then we'll have we'll achieved quite a lot. Now, this mandatory re-selection that I've been calling for for some time was actually described in the New Statesman as the Williamson Amendment. 
<laughs> you know you've arrived when you've got an amendment named after you. And I mean, I do genuinely think though that if you look at the way in which any elected official anywhere around the country, whether it be a trade union official, a councillor, the chair of the local bowls club, the secretary of the allotment association, they all have to go through a reselection process, don't they? AGMs for the allotment association, uh, trade union leaders are only allowed to stay in post for five years. And, you know, if democracy means anything, it means ensuring that we've got representatives who've got their feet on the ground and can actually really genuinely speak for the people that we seek to serve. And there's a massive, massive job out there because this economy has been rigged for the last 40 years since Thatcher came to power in 1979, imposing neoliberalism on the country. And that informed what the new Labour government did in the 13 years that we were in office. But under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, we've now got a common sense socialist programme that will ensure that we bring the utilities back into public ownership, we bring the railways back into public ownership, we introduce a minimum wage of at least £10 an hour, we stop crucifying students for having the temerity to get an education at university because we all benefit from an educated workforce. Paul Mason here is somebody who benefited from an education at university and he didn't have to pay tuition fees for the benefit of it. And I think we're all the better, aren't we, for having people like Paul Mason actually here with us today. So, yeah, there's a lot to do. We not just saw the corporations out. We need to get the economy working in favour of ordinary people. And we need to stop the Labour Party rigging the way in which we select our candidates for Parliament. And if we do all that, then I think we'll have achieved a hell of a lot. And um, that's all I want to say on a rigged economy. Chris William Dunn. The Dunn, Chris William Dunn. And we're going to go to a break in five minutes. But first, the unique, the irreplaceable, the immarquessable Paul Mason at Paul Mason News. Hello. Me and Chris are going to form a new band called Ultra Left Dads. <laughs> That's a cool band, huh? Anarcho, anarcho autonomous syndicalist dads. This is, hey, you know what? This is the real black block. This is the real black block. You know what, Maurice Glassman, who's, a, believe it or not, still, still a Labour peer. I was trying to, Maurice Glassman is one of our, our peers in Parliament. And he said to me, are you blue Labour or red Labour? And I said, well, I'm more of a Negri. He said, that's it, black Labour. Paul, I'll ask you a question. Chris was talking about one solution reselection. Solution. Reselection. Radical democracy, comrades. What's an, what's an analogue to that in the economy? How do we democratise the economy? A couple of minutes. Well, look, what, what I want to say is there's too much fucking triumphalism in this party. So listen to me. This party here and this party here. We've not won yet. Okay. And what is really important is that we transfer the energy that we've got into something that is like... Um, a, a kind of weapon that brings a lot of people who might not feel that happy to be sitting here over to us as Labour. And, and what we've got to do is to be confident and we've got to be kind of, it's okay, we've got to be kind of, you know, coherent in what we're saying. I, I want to tell you something. I, as a 20-year-old guy, was at the 1980 Labour conference. And I, I thought, I, I was a left winger, and I've sat in the balcony, and I said to my mate, this is shit. And, and then we went for lunch, it was, in Bright, it was in Blackpool, and we came back, and Tony Benn stood up, and he gave this speech, nationalise this, nationalise this. I can still see the whites of his eyes from all that distance. Uh, get rid of the House of Lords. And people think what John said and what Chris is saying is going back to that. Well, it is in energy terms, but we're going forward into a whole new technological future. And what tells me about that is I remember what that hall was like. 
I'd have to say to you that although the hall was full of left-wing delegates like me, the trade unions were not left-wing. They sat there like somebody slapped their face when, when Ben said this. And at that time, and I'd also have to say that your average Labour member was older than you, more working class than you possibly, but also, to be honest, they had a much less footprint of the individual. They hadn't got the education. You know, in a way, there's probably an army of fucking PhDs in social, social theory walking around here. And, and more fool the capitalists for creating an excess labor supply of them. But what that means is that what, what we've got here, why, why all the ordinary Joes are so elated, is that we've got a spontaneous radical social democratic movement like this. It's like Blackpool or Brighton Rock. Cut it anywhere, and it says the same thing. That's the weapon we will take into this, this next year. And I just want to say to you, when Labour win the election, I hope that we do, our MPs, know the words to the red flag. But what will really fuck up the bourgeoisie is if they also learn the words to the Internationale. Get singing it! Oh my God, it's like. It's like the father I never knew. This is amazing. So, I detect that the natives are getting restless. We're going to have a short break. Go to the bar, get pissed, get boozy, get Larry. Ask oh, someone out, come on. Then we're going to come back. We're going to have a band called Rum Committee. They are fucking excellent. After I'm committing, we're going to have some fun and games. We're going to see what Clive Lewis will do on camera. Thank you, guys. We have decided for the first time in Navarro media history to branch into the illustrious world of game show hosting. That's where I believe it. May I introduce our team of politicos, Team Gravy Train, come up on here. We have got Clive Lewis, MP. We have got Lloyd Russell Mole. We have got Winnie Wong. I'm afraid. 
afraid there's a price, my friends, because we need... A... <laughs> We're not... We haven't transcended a demand economy yet, my friend. We need a glamorous assistant up here Do we have store. a glamorous assistant? Wait. Glamorous assistant. All right, glamorous assistant. What's your name, Ivana? Sam. Hello, I'm Sam. Give up oh, for Sam, everyone. Sam, are you honestly wearing a Navarra Media t-shirt right now? I swear to God, Only I swear to God, pounds. you wasn't an audience yeah, plant. I swear to God. Sam, I need you with this book and a pen to be keeping score. Yeah, sure. I don't really know what a scoring system is. Just when someone's done something good, yeah, give yeah, them a point. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Intuitive, yeah. right? I've got my own pen. All right, yeah. so I want you, you to sit down on the end of the stage there, love. Sit there. All right. Be fine. Elena! Hey, yo, sorry. Oh, shit. On your knees, bitch. We in. <laughs> the Daily Mail is about to have a field day with this. I saw that live nice slot feed. drop back stage. It this was is meant to be a safe unreal. space. Thank you. Right. Introducing round one. Zoom and bust. Round one. We have Zoom and bust here at the World Transformed. We're not just about jokes. You're not here to have fun. This is about building and testing the skills of our public servants. Just how well do they know the absolute boy? I've got a favor to ask of all of you. One is to ignore the feedback noise. The second is we don't actually have a sound effect for when these pictures come up. So Your sound effect. When you see a swirly photo, I need you to make a noise like <laughs> Can you give can you give me a noise? That swirly noise. Pitiful. Pitiful. I said, can you do me a noise of intrigue? Now once more with feeling. <laughs> right, so. Can we see if your noisemakers are working, Team Levison? <laughs> Team Gravy Train. So, we've got a 10 second swirl photo. Once you know what that photo is, you ding in, we will pause it, and if you get it right, you get a point. I'm, and if you win. They're photos of Corbyn, that's probably something we should say. Oh, yeah, they're photos you of Corbyn. You have to identify not, what Corbyn it is. It's not going to be like topless Aaron or anything, don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah. So, Unless gone, something's gone a bit wrong with our system here, which is pretty Beautiful beautiful. tech team, beautiful invisible tech team. Can we please get our first swirling photo and an audience noise, please? Team Gravy 
train, Team Gravy Train. Wait, what was that? South African Embassy. South African Embassy. Clive Lewis, everybody. Jeremy. It was indeed our man, JC, taking a pitch that lovable for a right righteous there. cause. I mean, just saying, uh, James Butler and Amber Sunny both made looking, getting, made looking, getting arrested, but better. You have three more Corbins okay. left, contestants. There's still all to play for. All right, come on, introduce the next one, and let's get our crowd hype. Are you ready? Next, for Corbin Slowly number four. Corbin, please. Oh. Uh, what is it? Oh, John Foster! Okay, John Foster! Oh, I'm saying... I'm, no, we will not accept that answer. It now goes over to Team Gravy Train. No, Corbin, I think our sound effects are working. <laughs> mate, that was mate, when... That was Corbin with his... Did I hear Fred of the Frog from Lloyd Muscle? In Mexico. Bang on, my friend. Is that a correct answer? Yeah, yeah. That was a correct it's, answer. We've got it's another Jeremy one. Jeremy Corbyn with Fred of the Frog. It is three now. All right. So you said the wrong frog. You said the wrong frog. He said Fred of the Frog, my friend. I heard Fred of Fred This isn't a democracy. I don't think you know what's going on here. Next. Swirly Corbin, please. Right, can we please have our next Swirly Corbin and our audience noise of intrigue? Ooh. All right, John Foster. Outside Stonehenge. Oh, it was Corbin oh. outside Stonehenge. Inspector Incredible, Corbin. incredible work there. Team Leveson are back in the game. We can see Dawn Foster making friends already. <laughs> Look at that wing. Now we have Impossible. our final bonus round image. We're going to need Some an extra big shit. It's not Corbin, I'll tell you that much. Woo! Cohen 
for broke. What we are going to do, because we have heard some ridiculous things in the last election cycle. We heard that Corbyn was a terrorist, sympathising, bicycle riding, I don't know, grime fan, wearing. really. I mean, all these things are true. That's why he got my vote. We will be matching the bad political take to the journalists. Hence, going for broke. Also, can we please get a shout out for my man, John McDonnell at the back. He thinks that we can't see him. Yes. Man like John McDonnell is in the building if you needed any further evidence that this is the party to be at. So, let's go for it. So, do you want to read out the quotes, Eep? I'm going to hand over my yeah. mic. So, quote one. Pray silence, please, for the terrible take. Be quiet. I think if Jeremy leads us into a general election, we face a 1931-style wipeout for the Labour Party. Now, who was that hot taker? Literally all of them. I'll give you that one again. I think if Jeremy... Yeah. I think if Jeremy leads us into a general election, we face a 1931-style wipeout for the Labour Party. That was a buzz from Sam Chris. I'm afraid that was the incorrect answer. Any, any, anything further from Gravy Train? Where are you going? That was what the previous team said. <laughs> Both teams, the, the first team guessed Tony Blair and were wrong. And curiously, the second team then decided to go for Tony Blair again, just to check. And they were also wrong, I'm afraid. Owen Smith. I'm afraid you don't get a second guess, my friend. <laughs> oh, 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 from the audience. From the audience. Say that again, sir. Tristan Hunt. Tristan Hunt. It was Tristan Hunt. Number two. <laughs> yeah. So... Quote number two, silence in the cheap seats, bitches. As gambles go, i.e. Theresa May's gamble, is about the surest bet that any politician could ever place. May's gamble was a gamble for those who like their wages, ultimately low risk. Who came out with that gem of wisdom? Was it Matthew Dancona? It was not Matthew Dancona. Who was it? It was a journalist. I'll give you that much quickly. He was a journalist. Wait. Daniel Hodges. It was not Daniel Hodges. All of them. And <laughs> um, John Rental? No. Uh, Owen Jones. No, 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 no. <laughs> Polly Toynbee. It was not Polly Toynbee. I will say, and can I get a point for this? It was Jonathan Friedland. But real quick, real quick, real quick, we're going to take a real, real quick break in order to introduce a total legend. Breaking news, we got a stage invasion. He's, he's gonna be brief, because he's been very busy. He gave a fantastic speech. The People's Chancellor, John McDonnell! Okay. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay, okay. A revolutionary movement needs a bit of discipline. And you have no chance of achieving that objective. Discipline, I mean, not revolution. Anyway, let me just say this. I just, wanna, I just want to say this, okay? I just want to say thanks. Thank you so much. Because in coming to this conference, on the scale of it, the mobilization, the enthusiasm, and to be frank as well, the intellectual content, has just, has just been a huge, huge breakthrough for us as a movement. Our opponents, our opponents are expecting this to be a transitory thing and that somehow we'll all go back and be subjugated once again. So, so the most important thing now is, isn't it, and pardon the pun, is to maintain the momentum. So, in the next, in this next period now, the most important thing now is that we build, we grow, we recruit, we mobilize, we educate, we win the hearts and minds so that when we come in then these coming months, for whenever that election comes, we do it. So I am. John, John, before you go, I've got to ask one thing. Can I get a selfie for my mum? Yeah? Get in it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wait. I think. I think we might have another stage invader on the way, but just before. Jeremy, come on, Jeremy, come on. Just before we receive our next stage invader. Is she ready? We've got to finish, of course, this round of Cohen for Broke. Thank you. Wait. No, we've got another stage invader. And is it indeed my auntie? Auntie Diane Abbott, Shadow Home Secretary, Title Bad Girl. Yes!
guys, I don't feel you're taking this game show particularly seriously. Okay, we've forgotten our beautiful contestant doing such a fabulous job down here. Give it up for Sam again. You can stand up to take your applause if you like. Okay. <laughs> I'm, really, like, I'm really blind as a bat here. I mean, it's 3-3, three, three, but then John McDonald and Diane Albert are technically Okay, he has gone rogue. This was not anticipated, but so far, Diane Abbott is winning. One final round, my friends. All right, simmer down, simmer down. We all know she's the absolute girl. Round three. Round three, my friends. And the final one. We have Fixity Fortunes. It's like Family Fortunes, only it's got a terrible pun. No, let's repeat she this again in there. Woo! Chug! <laughs> yes, chug, 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 chug. Ah! Oh, yeah. All right, can we just get... I don't know how to feel anymore. So, who, which one of us is taking Clive Lewis home tonight? Because it ain't going to be me. So, okay. we have round, round three. three, our final round, and it's all to play for. Gravy Train, are you feeling confident? Hold on a second. We don't like the name Gravy Train. This is, uh, this is buying into an elitist establishment frame of politics. We're not having it. Clive, you're paid four times what I am. Okay, yeah, we'll get a new job. Okay. What about you, Team Leveson? Are you feeling confident? We're going to smash it. You're going to smash it? We're not going to smash it. I care about the truth. All right. We might smash it. You might smash it. See, there's the sense. How am I going to impose order? What I'm going to do is tell the man to fuck off because so far the women have been really good and he's been a pain Ooh. in the ass. So we've got a feminist revolution at hand in Team Leveson. Team Gravy Train is currently, uh, I don't know, I don't know what's going on over here, lads. Minus points for that. I'm not even English. Like, I'm American, so I, I'm like the... <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I'm not even English, I'm American, so I'm like a weak link for these guys. And we're not falling apart. We're doing pretty good over here. Like Bernie, 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 Bill the Bernie, Bernie, Bernie,
Mics, mics, we need and more mics. Weather spoons. Oh, that was spoons. number one. That was number one. Number one was in fact nationalized spoons. What about number two? Yep. Well, we kind of think that the right, handing over the right to make money is actually not the best place to be. So we're saying the banks. Nationalize the banks. Unfortunately for you, that was not one of our top three answers. Uh, one of the top three answers was indeed nationalize grinder. <laughs> we have a fierce grinder defender at the front of the audience. It's indeed the fixer's own Michael Walker. And that is the deep we also would have right accepted there. the answer, nationalized Greggs, but Team Leveson, you brought it back. Yeah. Nationalized Spoons, you are right in there. Question number two. The five pound note has Winston Churchill. The 10 pound note has Jane Austen. Hey. Oh, oh no, you don't boo her. She's Who? the absolute girl oh, as well. actually, I don't like Jane Austen. I'll fight Who you later. Oh, it's okay. Who should be on the £20 notes printed by John McDonald's Treasury? Diane Abbott! Okay. We love Diane. So, what are you going for? But it's got to be... Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. You are right. Okay. There are not enough white men on banknotes. I'm afraid. I'm afraid you're both wrong. I'm afraid they're both. They're both way off because the people have spoken. In a socialist utopia, there will be one thing and one thing only on the twenty-pound note, and that is topless Aaron Bastani. Diane Abbott, like, second, but, you know, it was close. Okay, so where are we in the point scoring? We've got one question left. Tiebreaker. No, keep it on, keep it on. I I'm not a young man anymore, huh? I'm going to do you a favour. Seriously, I'm going to do you a favour. It's, it's, it's far too early for that. <laughs> Okay, one final What is question. your position in this whole situation over there? <laughs> oh, that's the naughty step. It's a long story. <laughs> okay, one final question. One final burst of glory. Are you ready? Team Levinson? Are you ready? Team Gravy Train! socialist utopia for all three Corbyn's jam memes and racism <laughs> we have oh have i got an so we have Corbyn's jam yep. memes and racism and and racism <laughs> in a utopia okay <laughs> Going for tractors. Tractors. Tory tears. Tory tears. Oh yeah, suck it up, suck it up, baby, and the <laughs> NHS. Okay, well, you guys were technically correct, but his answer's banged, so they win. And, it, and if you don't like it. Do me. So, our independent adjudicator has been tallying up the scores. Who is our winner overall? Technically, it is John McDonald and Diane Abbott. <laughs> but a close second is the gravy train! 
baby train. So guys, we have got an evening of music ahead of you. We've got live performances from Soweto Kinch. We have got jams pumping out all night into the wee hours from Horsemeat Disco. We have Team Navara getting drunk and slutty at the bar. And what's more, we have a table of merch. You can pay via PayPal if you don't have cash. We don't get paid. We do this for free. And you can look sexy, fit, foxy, fly for a reasonable price. Woo! So I'm going to leave it to our esteemed host, Aaron Bastani, to wrap up. Wait there, wait there. Remember, there are no losers in socialism. What That's the great thing. No losers in socialism. Winners with socialism. That is a great. I just want to say Thank quickly. Thank you, Clive Wanker. I just want to say quickly. None of this is possible. None of the last four days without the world transformed. And these and these young people and a lot of them are teenagers. They were here five days before it started to clean this place up. It was a squat. They are absolute heroes and heroines of the Labour movement and of the movement to change all social relations in the world today. Now, we obviously show them our gratitude, but they also want to be even bigger and better next year. Okay? They want to do this bigger than the Labour Party conference, and they will. They will. But if just one in five of you go to their website, give them a monthly subscription, they can do it. Now, not everybody can afford to do that, but if you can, please consider it. Because they have made possible, I think, the most phenomenal, most phenomenal social space I've seen on the British left in my lifetime. Really, really. On that note, let's get drunk. Thank you.